Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul series now in 1.0.5. So in an effort to figure out my problems I've decided to upgrade the series now to the latest version of all the mods. All the mods have been updated and of course KSB itself is now in 1.0.5. So uh, hopefully we'll get to the bottom of this. One interesting issue is that I forgot that in the VAB the orientation of things uh, changes the center mass and center lift. I'll get to that in a sec, but first we have to check out a few other things. And of course a lot has changed. All the mods have changed. RP0 itself has changed. The tech tree has changed. And what that means is that the Pluto 1C that I was using is actually not accessible to us right now. It has locked parts. I think it's actually the size of the procedural tanks. They decided that my current tech level isn't good enough to have the size of the tank that I put on there. So um, let's take a look at the tech tree first. Alright, so we have some parts that we need to unlock and unfortunately that's gonna cost us some funds. Uh, some of these maybe I can pass on. It looks like all the ladders, well that that's sensible. At least they put all the ladders at the bottom there. Um, I wanna be, uh, something is costing quite a lot to them. Well maybe it's just the accumulation of all of them. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem to unlock the stuff that costs zero. I'll go through these uh, in a little bit, but maybe uh, some of this is why I couldn't uh, couldn't open the Pluto in the VAB. Yeah, all of these parts have to be unlocked again, but uh, some of these I won't use for this, these. These are, some of these are stock parts that I'm not going to use. And uh, I am running in OpenGL mode. The mod list is. Uh, uh, the same except for T. Arabi, I think that's Tentaris Arabi, or I guess we'll call it Terabi, um, which is basically really, really early engines because, like, that's what I need right now. Um, but it's required by RP0 now, so I have to put it in. But it's, um, as far as I'm concerned, rather useless. Uh, so I, I'm sure I had the LR91 vacuum engine, but they changed something about it, so now I have to unlock it again. Um, I'm going to be very selective about why I unlock, so I'm not going to do it in front of the camera. But you get the basic point. At least our the technologies themselves have, have not changed. I, I, oh, that, that, that might be a thing. The procedural... Yeah. Anything to do with the procedural parts or procedural fairings probably is important for me to unlock if I want to use... See that too. Uh... To, un to use my Pluto probe. I said Pluto probe, what I meant was actually Pluto rocket. Anyway, here we are in the VAB, and I've opened up the Astrid 5. But to show you what I meant about the, the direction of things uh, affecting the center mass and center lift in the VAB, FAR assumes that the flow of air is going from the top down in the VAB. And so you see the capsule has a very nice sort of center mass and center lift configuration here, right? This is all very sensible and all. Uh, if you're going, you know, straight up. If you're coming down, this would not be good because the center of lift will be ahead of the center of mass. But if you flip it around, well, now it's assuming the airflow is still coming from that way. Now it's heat shield first. And now, well, we've got this huge gap between the center of mass and center of lift, don't we? Let's say I, I, I put on, now this, this capsule failed, so uh, this is not the Pluto probe one, because I can't uh, open that one right now. But uh, actually, uh, the putting the able core and the tank on top made it better, because it moved the center of mass closer to the center of lift. Uh, but the center, there's no way the center of lift is ever going to be on the opposite side of the center of mass like this. Uh, so that's an interesting point. Uh, people thought that the reason it flipped around was because we had uh, too much at the top. Uh, probably the reason why it was wiggly and flippy was because I had removed the able core and we had too little on the top. And so lacking mass on the top, the center of mass and center of lift were very, very far apart. Now, of course, if you flip it around again, well, that... That's uh, assuming airflow is going like this. This is the way you want it. But now the center of mass is a little bit higher. The center of mass and center of lift are still in the same uh, same correct relative position. So yeah, it's a bit complicated. Uh, uh, now this is the version without the heat shield, but it does have the able, able, able avionics core there. If you put on the heat shield, 
that's a totally different business. So let's find, uh, these are still locked. Oh no, the, the two meter one is fine. Okay, lunar, lunar rated heat shield. All right. So, okay, let me take this off, put this on. Now that's interesting. It looks like they fixed an issue. I'm not, I'm not sure if they fixed an issue or not, but uh, at least uh, before, the heat shield used to affect the center of lift in very odd ways. Let me see if the other ones do it. Let me just uh, throw one of these on. Now I already know that tweak scaling a heat shield would be a very, very bad thing to do, so you don't have to tell me about that. And I wouldn't do that. I did just put on the 2 meter one without any tweak scaling. So that's the right way around. In fact, that's beneficial. You know, the center mass and center lift are even closer together now, exactly, pretty much exactly what, the way you'd want it. This way, and this way. Okay, so anyway, uh, that's just a review of the interesting things about pods in the VAB. But putting the stuff at the top is not actually causing a problem. Uh, I do have to emphasize that. Uh, something else was going on. And maybe it's actually that I had too little on the top. Is uh, Remember, I removed two parachutes, I removed the able core, and um, if we did take off this, this stuff, you see, things, things do change. Um, and the gap between those is quite a, quite a distance, and you can sort of imagine it going a little bit awry like that. Uh, so, anyway, uh, aside from uh, the Astrid 5, all of our rockets are accessible except for the Pluto. And I think that's just because of its large diameter and we have to unlock the correct size. Uh, on that note, I will try and unlock the stuff and create a new rocket and I'll show you what I've got. Um, I guess we should try to send a Kerbal up and bring him back down again. If I can unlock the Pluto, I guess the the obvious thing to do would be to use that direct one. Uh, we already have one building. We've already built about 40% of it uh, according to Kerbal construction time. Uh, I can't access that window right now. Anyway, I'll be back to you in a sec. Okay, well I sense a bit of a problem here. The antenna I was using for transmissions back from Mars, you remember we sent a probe out, uh, an interplanetary probe already. Uh, was the Reflectron KR7. It has been nerfed, and I knew this beforehand because I have been using uh, RO and 1.0.5 for my Twitch series. So I had fixed it in my Twitch series, in other words I reverted it back to the stats it was before because we already had stuff uh, that was headed out to Mars with these antennae on it. Uh, but uh, since I have to go by the RP0 rules, and we don't have any craft that are actually out there right now. Maybe some satellites that are supposed to communicate with such craft, but not actual probes that are on their way. I'm going to have to deal with this. But it basically means that we don't have any antennae that could communicate with an interplanetary craft, which is strange. Which is strange at this stage, because if we're going to do lunar flybys, uh, we go with, with uh, you know, crude lunar flybys, we probably should have an antenna that can communicate with another planet by now. Um, I do have this non-RO AIES ComTech dish, which would be capable of it, but I suspect that because it's non-RO, it's against the rules. There is this Pioneer class antenna. I guess that's the thing to use, huh? But that's like way out. No, 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 wait. Uh, uh, 20 million kilometers? Oh, I guess not. Wait, uh, there, there's some uh, cognitive dissonance here. No, 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 wait a minute. Um, dish range, it says 20 billion meters, right? In the in the antenna description there. In the stated description, it says effective range 1,500 billion meters, or 1.5 terameters. Um, which would make sense for the Pioneer 10-11 class antenna, but that's not what it's actually giving me. It's actually giving me an antenna that can't do even... I mean, uh, I have to think about this. Uh, 20 million kilometers. 
I don't think that's enough for Mars either. Actually, that's not enough for anything in particular. I wonder what it's for, actually. Is it something that gets upgraded later or something? We, there are RTGs here. They're really expensive, though. That's interesting. So, already we have the technology for RTGs and the potential Voyager spacecraft, according to it. But, I don't know. The communication seems a little bit haphazard. And, well, I've, I've had this issue, like I said, in Soul System colonization, and I just reverted all the changes. I just brought back all the old antennae instead. Uh, well, uh, we're not planning to do interplanetary probes today, so uh, I'll let that be. But we're going to have to ponder that for future missions. Okay, anyway, uh, I think I've got everything unlocked that I can unlock or should unlock. Some of these other parts uh, will unlock as necessary. Yeah, only if I really, really feel like I need them. I have no idea how I got the Mercury Parachute Mini. I would have thought that that was part of FASA Mercury bunch. Yeah, it says FASA Probe Parachute. Oh, Probe Parachute. That's why I kept the probe section. All right. All right, then. So on to the VAB, and I will build us something. Okay, so please witness this way around. If the airflow is going the, from top down here, center mass is above center of lift. Flipping it around, airflow going this way, center of mass is above center of lift. And they're reasonably close together, though maybe not as close as I would like. But in order to change that, we would have to add more mass here. Now we could, I've only dumped 100 ablator. We could dump the rest of the ablator on the capsule, but as you can see, that doesn't move the center mass very much at all. And I'm loathed to uh, dump the ablator on here, though that certainly does move it a bit more. Okay, so that's going to be the capsule. We've got hydrazine inside the capsule. This is just a food, water, and oxygen tank. I suppose I could add some more hydrazine up here. 30 units. That'll bring the center of mass up a bit. Okay. And I've got clearance for the little RCS thrusters at the top. They've changed the model a bit. I guess that's been stock revamp for you. Alright. Well, let me build the rest of the rocket. Okay, so I've gotten to building the second stage now. As you can see, the rest of the rocket is built. I've decided to call it Paris because for some reason the the quote will always have Paris popped into my head and well when you get inspiration like that you don't don't ignore it but uh, obviously the engine I wanted to put on here was the J2 and unfortunately it doesn't seem like we have the J2 this time I uh, I'm sort of surprised we have the RL10 and all but uh, I suspect it's probably by because of fans of this particular LR87 LH2 engine which has been uh, been introduced here and so I guess we're gonna have to use that yep uh, well fans of this engine congratulations you have finally forced me to use it <laughs> uh, alright uh, so we'll see how the rest of the rocket goes based on that okay well this is sort of a ridiculous looking rocket on the whole uh, especially with that part there and the fact that this is so wide but that is probably necessary because a I don't want to increase part count and B well I basically got a proton at the bottom here and you know how the proton looks it looks like it has uh, six fake boosters they're not really boosters they're permanently attached to the thing and that look would be better but it would also require more parts uh, these are the proton engines I think uh, I've configured them to RD275 uh, yes uh, there's no point configuring it to RD253 uh, because we already have the 275 configuration unlocked so uh, that gives us 285 at sea level 317 of vacuum and plenty of thrust they do burn uh, UDMH and N204 which is not the most pleasant mix of fuels ever but uh, uh, the power is nice and the fuel density is nice as opposed to what we have in the upper tank I mean you could uh, say we could use a lot of those um, which got 
the engines that I have, you know, these uh, LR87 LH2 vacuum engines. Uh, if you look, the sea level ISP is 350 and the vacuum is 403. Uh, we need twice as many, we need 12 of them. Uh, the trouble with that is that I would have to use service module tanks. Even though I've upped the utilization a bit, it doesn't make up for the fact that the tank is really heavy. Uh, here you see dry mass 14.4 tons, wet mass 62.3 tons, let's say. So ratio-wise, it's about a quarter of the mass is just a tank. A little less than a quarter, let's say 20%. Uh, here with the regular tanks, it's much, much better. I mean, this default tank, only 19.55 tons dry, and it holds 687.3 tons wet. That's a huge difference. I mean, this this is only maybe, what, uh, 3%, 4%, 3% of the mass of the tank is the, is the dry mass. Uh, here, you're talking more like 20% or more. So, yeah, that's why I couldn't build the Saturn one, by the way, uh, is because of the mass of the service module tanks. If I, if the mass of the service module tanks was lighter, I could build a Saturn one. Also, if we just had the cryogenic option, which everybody knows and loves, then the the Saturn one would be possible. But we don't have the cryogenic option unlocked right now, so this is the best I can do. So yeah, uh, basically, sort of a proton-ish kind of thing. Uh, except I have the 800 ton limit and I'm under that, I'm under the height limit making sure that we squeak by there and that is the situation now there's all sorts of questions here uh, should we send a Kerbal on this? This is basically the test flight of a brand new rocket so that's a problem and that's not possible really because we have the crewed lunar flyby in 193 days and it's gonna take 120 days to build one of these. Now we could hurry that up, but not by too much. Um, it this can get to a lunar flyby, uh, assuming that the RL10 doesn't quit on us, which is a good question, by the way. I don't know what it doesn't seem like. Test flight is in charge of these RD275s. It doesn't seem like test flight is in charge of this LR87 dash LH2. The RL-10 is the only one I think it's actually going to mess around with, but I do have the latest version of test flight, so there's no telling what it might decide to do. Anyway, so that's all floating in my head right now. Uh, you may have noted the high, high thrust to weight ratio when we close out this stage. Don't worry, I have action grouped the engines at the bottom in pairs. They're attached in pairs. So I'll be able to su shut them down in pairs. That's my plan. Okay. Otherwise, it should be a uh, calm ride if, uh, if it all works out. Well, anyway, what else can I do? I could simulate this, and I know some of you would suggest to have Kerbal Construction Time simulate, but... And probably I should have done that for a lot of other flights before this, but... We are just going to plunge ahead, because that's the way I am. I'm going to build one of these. So it turns out that the reason why we can't launch the Pluto 1C is because the J2 is still locked. So I'm going to move it down. And we will proceed with the Paris 1. And I want to be able to finish both of them before time runs out on this contract. Uh, it looks like that's possible, but let's, let's rush build this a little bit. And in fact, uh, well, let me close that and let's get some headway on that one as well. We may need to edit it if uh, the first one turns out to have a problem. Uh, technology is unlocking. We will have improved stage combustion soon, so that's nice. Otherwise, we, uh, we have negative 15 upgrade points. So we're sort of in debt as far as upgrade points is concerned. I don't know how that works out, but, well, that's what uh, upgrading stuff does to you sometimes. Don't know about this current launch pad to rename or new, what that means. Hmm. Okay, well, uh, lots of questions. Let's take a look at what ha let me take a look at what improved stage combustion has in it, because we're going to finish that before this rocket launches. Maybe I'll come up with a different design.
So improved stage combustion is right here, and it's the one with the NK33, NK43. And it's possible this could be better than the Proton engines. It's a close call. The, now, it does have the benefit of throttle, which means we could just throttle down the engines instead of uh, shutting them down. That's nice. It also unlocks the RD270, which is a really, really huge engine. Largest single chamber engine ever built in the Soviet Union. We haven't even got the F1 yet. Isn't this sort of more advanced? I don't know. Maybe not. Seems like it ought to be. And we even have one that uses pentaborane. Um, well, there's the F1. I guess I can't blame them. It's sort of in the same tier. Though we can't research that because we need to unlock the next level in the VAB. Whereas we were able to research this. I guess these engines are simpler than the... I don't know. Uh... Some of these engines that they've put on heavy orbital rocketry are actually quite simple compared to the RD-270M, you would think. Oh well, okay. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's definitely possible that I could build a better rocket with these engines. But I guess we'll go with what we've got for now. And picking our victim. Uh, not Bill. Oh, what happened to... Oh, did I probably... Probably killed somebody. Uh, hold on. I need to hire a pilot. I think. I mean, well, technically we've got the remote controller on. But we need a pilot with a lot of courage. Hiring is only 10,000, it looks like. Alright. Piper, then. We do have the remote controller. Technically, we could send anybody, but yeah, I've, I've lost uh, Valentina as well. That's what I thought. What, 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 what. Okay, well, all right. So something went horribly wrong. I did restart the game before trying to um, trying to launch this thing. Um, F3. Uh, no, everything just exceeded G-force tolerance. Um, and I can't revert. Now I, I zipped up the save, so I can revert. So, uh, Piper does not have to perish at this juncture. But... So now I have another problem. <laughs> um, I, I did... It is a fresh install. I installed all the mods one by one. Just in case you're wondering. Um, obviously it loads fine. There is no mod missing. I know this. Hmm. Cobra Joint Reinforcement was all obviously present and actually didn't finish its job. Cobra Joint Reinforcement was still trying to reinforce joints when Piper Kerman perished. I don't know. Well, um, I'll restore the I'll restore the save afterwards. But let's try and launch the second one and see if it does the same thing. Hmm, yeah. Structurally, there's no particular difference between this rocket and any other one that I've built. In other words, uh, the no struts missing, no extra struts, that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, no struts at all, in fact, because Kerbal Joint Reinforcement and everything. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, I'll take it out to the launch pad empty. It uh, doesn't need a Kerbal in, technically. Uh... KJR is now stabilizing physics, and well, the rocket is a bit askew after KJR has done that. 
you can see we're not pointing straight up and down. There, there is clearly some weird buffeting initially. Um, there are a number of possibilities. I mean, it could be KSC Switcher, which uh, hasn't been updated as far as I know. But uh, I'm using uh, the old version uh, in other installs without any problems, so I'd be surprised if it's that. And in fact, uh, practically everything is something that I'm using elsewhere, except for you know Test Flight uh, T uh Vent Stock Revamp. Those are ones that I only use here. Oh, uh, Custom Barn Kit and the Asteroid Day Pack. That's a new one. That's now required, but wasn't required before by RP0. None of that should cause any problems. Well, um, we're askew, but technically we can time warp, and probably best to try this out. I will restore the old save to save Piper, because, well, that was obviously a freak glitch anyway. So lining up with the moon, uh, we'll see what we can do, how far this gets. It does look really ugly. I should, maybe I'll just uh, bite the bite the bullet on the part count and make it look like Proton, because it is basically a Proton first stage. But I don't know, uh, the, uh, if anybody has had that, the, the flutter that we saw initially, and knows what causes that, please tell me. Because we're definitely not sending a Kerbal out again until we figure that one out. And I haven't seen it before. Well, I mean, I haven't seen it since, like... I mean, in point two four, you'd have all sorts of stuff like that happening. And maybe point point two five, I think it was already gone. So, yeah, very curious. This is OpenGL, not 64-bit, so... Alright, uh, well, let's see if everything else works while we're here. Ignition. Okay, well, first time I press the spacebar, it doesn't work. That's very interesting. Let's try again. Alright, and launch. Insufficient avionics. Oh yeah, it is insufficient avionics. Well, that's just silly. I forgot about the avionics because I've been building stuff in solar system colonization this whole time. That's funny. Hmm, yep. Well, that would be a problem, huh? Okay, well, let me revert to save. Let me put... Yeah. Let me put the appropriate avionics on the rocket, build them, and then work on them. Well, just out of curiosity, let's see how this goes. So, uh, can, I, can I steer it all? I mean... I'm wondering if the avionics can be fooled by Smart ASS or not, is the thing. While we're simulating, we can simulate. Can I load in a program into KOS when there's... Hmm. I don't think this is the best time to do it. Let me... Well, let me... While we're trying stuff out, let me uh, try and load my two-stage launch script, and I'll see how that works out. Um, God, get the thrust-weight ratios right. I don't know if it'll work on the fly or not, but hey, I think it was 1.21 initially. Second stage thrust-weight ratio 1.71. Ending at 1.71. Okay. Oh. Check space on device. Not so much for that idea. I usually save it to archive. Uh, oh, all right. Yeah, I usually set it to archive like that. Anyway, let me just continue. 
Now, if we could get it to the third stage, we will have enough avionics by then. Well, look on the bright side. Uh, the capsule is not developing any heat. We didn't see any heat bar or anything like that so far. Alright, well, it's all good so far, but I'm gonna shut down two of the engines now. Okay, well, that works. Back down to 2.5 G's. Alright, well, let's keep it to 3 G's. Let me shut off another two. There we go, we're just on two engines now. I suppose Proton must get pretty high G-forces. Unless, I don't think these engines throttle, so... Unless they shut down some engines as well. Then again, it's got a heavier second stage. It's got another UDMH N204 stage as second stage. And that one has like double the thrust that I have on my second stage. So I guess it's lifting more and probably doesn't get quite as much as far as G-forces are concerned. Well, I thought about trying 64-bit with this install, but I was afraid of bugs. Turns out that uh, I was gonna avoid bugs anyway. In fact, the uh, bug that we had with the rocket swaying and the G-forces killing Piper at the beginning, uh, on the first launch attempt, is worse than any bug I've seen in 64-bit, so <laughs> it's a bit ironic, but... But here we are. Alright, let me cycle to SAS temporarily. Oh, I can't do SAS, right. No avionics. Well, we'll stay on Smart ASS then. Okay, stage set. And ignition. Alright, ignition is good. Here we go, LR87 liquid hydrogen version. Let's get rid of the launch escape system. Alright, that is nominal. And we proceed with, uh, with a dubious launch, but it's, it's working, so I guess we'll test something. We'll get something done, but we'll have to revert all this. Call it a simulation, then everybody wants me to do uh, KCT simulations. Well, just call this a KCT simulation, I suppose. Okay, well, it doesn't look like I got as much out of this stage as I was thinking I would get. So we're going to have to burn about 300 meters per second in the third stage, so that's quite alright. We have uh, probably 400 meters per second to spare, and then we'd still be able to make the moon on the third stage without using the service module. And we still have a thousand meters per second in the service module in case, for some reason, the third stage, you know, quits on us or something like that. We are currently uh, go for orbit on the service module if it turns out that the third stage doesn't ignite because RL-10 is the only thing that test flight understands. Though, um, it didn't seem to pop up with the little window here. But, the, yeah, uh, hold on. Yeah, there it is. Whoop. Yeah, it does understand the RL-10 and just the RL-10. Okay, separation. And ignition. And we have avionics. Yay! And let's extend the antennae. Very good. Okay, approaching orbit now. We gotta keep the periapsis relatively low. Alright. Well, we have plenty to spare for the moon. I mean, the moon will take about 3,100. We've got 200 more. So, looking good so far. Yep. And, uh, well, let me plot for the moon, I guess. Okay, well, I could probably get something better, but I think I'm satisfied with this. Uh, passing to 7,218 kilometers at the moon periapsis, and we've got a good periapsis on the Earth side. 170 kilometers, but that's easily adjusted. So, uh, for now, since this is just a test, we will uh, go with that. And let us get the solar panels out. 
I've actually grouped the solar panels and antennae on the service module separately so we don't get the message that they are stowed. And we can proceed to the maneuver node. Okay, I should probably start out. Well, I should have probably started this burn a little bit earlier. But, alright. Off. Uh, I should have locked the tanks up there too. Well, let me do the RCS myself. So that we don't use too much. Whoa, that's a lot. Uh oh, no connection. Uh huh. Well, that's a surprise. It's possible that the range of some of the antennae of my many, 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 many satellites in orbit has changed. And therefore, I mean, we should be getting into the range of that one pretty soon. Maybe. Not range so much as line of sight. I guess that Astrid 4 probe isn't going to help. It's got to mess up the transfer somewhat, but uh, again, it's more important to just do the re entry test. Okay, we've got a connection. All right, well, anyway, like I said, we'll just start out and then see how it re enters. That's what I'm curious about, after all. All right, well, we're hardly doing this precisely anyway, so ignition. Point me to the node. All right, so we'll have a vague transfer to a moonish kind of altitude. And uh, we'll see what we do from there. Okay, because I was looking at other things, I didn't notice when the engine quit on us. Um, looks like we still have 943.1 left. Engine shut down. Uh, maybe we can continue though. Let's see if it's settled. It's very stable, so I'm throttling down and I'm going to reactivate the engine. Oh, uh, let me throttle up and reactivate the engine. There we go. No worries. Still continuing on. Probably we're not going to hit the moon the way I want to, but because like we're way off now, nine minutes off of the maneuver node. But we'll try our best. The delay in our burn seems to be having the positive side effect of bringing our periapsis down, and so eventually this stage will also deorbit, right? It'll have a suborbital periapsis. We are already below the atmosphere line of 130 kilometers. We'll see if that continues. Okay, here we go. We'll probably run out of this stage, actually. And that's because of the radial deviation we have there. Technically, I'm not too interested in having the moon interfere. Right now, our periapsis will be pretty good. Anyway, we'll, we'll have enough delta V in the service module stage in order to correct whatever we need to correct. So that's that stage. Um, we could boost higher. But I think this is going to be a good enough test for me. So let's just do this. Alright, so set. Alright. Antennae and solar panels on this stage out. Okay, RCS on. Very good. Let's lock up everything in here that doesn't really need to be free. Huh, I thought I had put some hydrazine in here. I don't see the hydrazine I put up there. That is interesting. Well, I've got hydrazine up there, but that's almost run out. And I can't transfer stuff, can I? Still haven't gotten that technology. Yep. Let me lock this hydrazine now. I don't know if that's got to be enough to keep us stable or do whatever. We'll have to come straight down. We're not going to be able to hop out of the atmosphere with so little hydrazine left. Okay. So, orbit prograde. Okay, you're getting close, but we're also losing the moon encounter. We, uh, I mean, if I bring it to below 111 kilometers, we'll probably lose the moon encounter. There. 
as I expected. All right, so we've lost the moon encounter. We'll have to make further adjustments at Apoapsis, I'm sure. Okay, so out to Apoapsis we go. No need for more RCS for now. And, um, hmm. The rotation might lead us to drain electric charge, so let me reconsider this. RCS on. Okay, let's try that again. RCS on. SAS on. Yeah, that seems to be the correct direction to point anyway. So settle it down. And now we'll time warp because persistent rotation doesn't operate when SAS is on. And we really don't need this rotating all over the place. Okay, we are approaching Apoapsis now. And here we go. Alright, I think we just need to retro a little bit. Up, or uh, sorry, we're pointing retrograde as it is, so forward. And 62.5, I believe, was the straight down altitude. So we'll go with that. Well, the downside to not using 64 bit is, of course, no clouds right now. I think there may be a way to get clouds without using RVE, just with using environmental visual enhancements. I'll think about that. Okay, here we go. Let's point retrograde now. Now, since I want to do the test, I don't want to uh, try and retroburn with the service module engine, even though that would be safer. We want a harsh, as, as harsh as possible a test. We don't have any antennae on the, on the capsule itself. So let me go ahead and... Of course, we've got a built-in antenna on the Able Avionics package, but that's not very good. Let me check the info on the parachutes to make sure I've got it right. No, I don't. I did set it right, but it doesn't seem to have taken hold. You know how that goes. Alright, copy to other chutes. There are four small chutes here, instead of four large ones. Okay. So I'm going to arm them just in case I lose connection. Now the way MechJeb is wiggling does not make me happy. Let's try and go to fine controls, uh, fine controls. Okay. I'm gonna try descent mode. Let's, I guess we'll, we'll stage first and then try descent mode. So let me unlock all the things. Alright, we will stage, and then I'll activate the scent mode. Alright, well here we go. It's a little bit dark. I did put ambient light adjustment in, didn't I? Yeah. Well, if this works, we're not going to change anything about this capsule when we send the uh, Kerbal up. However, I still need... And there goes the service module. I do need advice on how to fix the wobble on the launch pad that, uh, you know, pretend killed Piper, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, so we're definitely going to have a little bit of trouble if that continues. Now, I kept a hundred ablator on the capsule. Just in case. It seemed prudent. Well, we have some serious ablation. So that's like working right. I'm not seeing the whole descent mode thing still. We're definitely not moving away from retrograde at all. Verify descent mode. Well, it says turn descent mode off, so descent mode ought to be on. We gotta have to watch for high g-forces, that was also a problem. That was what killed Jeb first. 
Descent mode is supposed to alleviate the G-forces. Oh, we still got the pitch and yaw maxing out thing. I mean, well, it's getting there. Yeah, G-forces are supposed to be uh, alleviated by the descent mode, but we don't seem to have the COM offset working for us. I could take Smart ASS off. Well, it's not holding pitch anyway. I suppose I should see what happens. No, well, it's not moving to any good direction. You you want it tilting up, obviously. It's not really doing that. And it's not tilting in any particular way. We are going up, but I do expect us to be coming straight down anyway. So, a minor bounce, if you will. Coasting through this area of the atmosphere. But does that mean we're going to meet with extremely high G-forces? We're already at uh, almost 3 Gs now. The longer we stay at 3, 3 Gs, the better off it is. It seems stable. It's not all that different from the other capsule that I launched in 1.0.4. G-force is diminishing, but don't be fooled. We'll have a... we're still going up. We have to go back down again, and then it'll pick up again. Ablation seems to have done a good amount of ablating. Not a huge amount, but, you know, at least it's convincing. At least it's not just a dozen units of ablator. Okay, we're going back down now. Still got plenty of speed to burn off, though the harshest part of it has probably already occurred. I mean, the harshest heating has probably already occurred. The G-forces still might peak up a bit. Where are we? We are... Sudanish, Sort of Sudan. There's Ethiopia. We might, uh... Well, we're not in the most hospitable area to land in that you could ever imagine. Well, this is pretty darn good so far. We're burning off a lot of speed here. 4 G's. 6 G's. Well, not as good as I would have hoped. 7 G's, but I think we're peaking right there. 10.5. Well, it's all over but the parachutes. So, yeah, well, that worked. Of course, the tests that we had in 1.0.4 also worked. Well, oddly enough, now it's spinning back and forth all over the place. I don't know why. Maybe I'll... I, I don't have a connection, though, so I can't really turn... Descent mode off. Nope. But now it's sort of rocking back and forth even though there should be a lot of air pressure holding it steady to retrograde. That's alright, the parachutes will deploy soon enough. Okay, there we go. Parachutes have deployed and it's steadying out. Okay, full parachute deployment is successful, bringing us to 4 meters per second. Seems gentle enough. Alright, there we are. So, yeah, there's our conclusion for you. Tell me what you think about the wobbling on the launch pad. That seems to be the only problem preventing us from going forward with the crewed mission. So I'm going to revert the two flights that we did, um, restoring the save that I did prior to uh, launching Piper. Yep. Alright, so uh, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, especially about that one problem, please do leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.